Hello everybody, thank you to Alliance Francaise. My name is Lisa McInerney and I am here to read for you this evening. I'm going to read a little bit from my third novel, which is The Rules of Revelation. And it is, I guess, a kind of a loose follow up to my previous two novels, The Glorious Heresies and the Blood Miracles, set in Cork City. Um, and it's about reunions and it's about recriminations and it's about all sorts of reckonings and chickens coming home to roost. So I hope you'll enjoy. The bit I'm reading for you this evening is from the point of view of Maureen, who is 68 years of age. And she has just, in this, in this section, she's going to come across some uh, tourists and take them under her wing. She had a new vocation sprung on her. She was north of the Lee one morning, minding her own business, when one of three ones wearing anoraks and sensible trousers asked, Is this the point for the tour? Is this the what for the what? Maureen said. The meeting point for the walking tour, the one on the right said, in an accent Maureen thought was probably German, and then, Oh, sorry, I thought you were the guide. I'm not, Maureen said, though I suppose I have the shoes for it. The footpath by the entrance to the development in which Jimmy had bought her apartment was cracked and uneven. She had taken to exercising caution and wearing clodhoppers. I think we are in the wrong place, said one of the ones. It was twenty past the hour. It'd be the wrong time for a tour, surely, Maureen said. Though if you walked a few steps that way, you'd get a different time again. The four lawyers, you see? One of the ones dutifully asked. Four liars? That's what they call the Shandon clock. Four faces, four different times. They did repairs on it a few years ago but could do nothing about the lying. It's all in the mechanism, apparently, that the four clocks will have four different ideas of the time. It's in the inner workings of the Irish to be liberal with the truth. Not that you'd like that, aren't you, fierce punctual? Germans! The three wands laughed. I didn't think my accent was so strong said the middle one, and the one on the left said, We're from Rothwell in the south. Is that a city? It's a town, a very old town. Maureen was disappointed. She wanted to talk about southern cities and geographical camaraderie. she developed a speech on the subject after a conversation at a bus stop six months ago with a stocky pup from Krakow. How long are you waiting on your guide? she asked. I think almost thirty minutes. We rang the bells in the tower while we were waiting. Maybe he came and left again. Not a bit of it, Maureen said. Thirty minutes is a bit much, even for the fellas around here. You must have the wrong place, because Corkonians would leave you waiting, but they wouldn't leave you down. And in the spirit of that statement, I'll escort you to where you were supposed to end up. I'm Cork born and bred, I know where I'm going. Oh, that isn't necessary. We wouldn't like to trouble you. No trouble, said Maureen, wild-eyed. She led the ones to the Butter Museum and the Firkin Crane and recounted what she remembered about Cork's dairy industry, which wasn't much. So she told them instead about, about a recent case involving an Irish butter smuggling ring in Wisconsin. The name of the butter involved was Kerrygold, but she didn't want to confuse the Germans by invoking the neighbours. Cork butter, she told them, was the best in the world. The social welfare, she said, used to give out butter vouchers, that's how important butter was. The elderly, the infirm, the layabouts all got subsidised butter, God be with the days. They stopped at Griffith Bridge, and Maureen looked back towards Shandon, hands on her hips. I'd say there's not much else on the north side for you, she thought hard. The old jail is out Sunday as well. Yes, said the one on the right, we visited on Wednesday. My mother was from Sunday as well. They have waxworks in that jail, and I swear to God, two or three of them are the head off her. She looked like them, clarified the one in the middle. She was an old bitch, Maureen said, with a face like a half-chewed toffee. Like a half-chewed toffee. And the toffee you get in Ireland would glue your jaw shut, Maureen said, staring. She recovered and waved an arm. That's the north side now. Less about places of interest, more about people of interest. Ten minutes up there and you come to the North Mon where all the great lads went to school. 
Terence McSweeney and Frank O'Connor and Neil Tobin and her own Taoiseach, Jack Lynch and Rory Gallagher, God rest their souls. I've read Frank O'Connor's stories, said the one on the right. I haven't, Maureen said. Cork is a very male place. But then I suppose isn't that the way of history? It's all feckin' men. Here now they're proud of Roy Keane. Oh, a fine Northside boy. And Killian Murphy and Jonathan uh, Rice, what's his name? And Dennis Irwin and the little fecker off Game of Thrones. Jesus, is the only woman we had Danny Le Feckin' Rue. These are celebrities, the one in the middle said. Well, insofar as they can be around here. Come down now this way, I want to show you something. They walked westwards along a disquietingly high lee. Maureen stopped at the footbridge at the end of the quay. This is St Vincent's Bridge. Two of the ones took photographs through the lattice steel. And there, Maureen pointed, is where I used to live. A ground floor flat in a done up townhouse. Though you wouldn't know that now because it went up in flames a few years back. I was only in it when I found out it used to be a brothel. How long ago? One of the ones asked. Maureen was looking too intently at her old home to identify the speaker. Was it a brothel? Oh, just before he moved in. It's illegal in Ireland. Brothel keeping is, Maureen said, who had done her research and considered herself better informed than the average nana. But didn't I tell you, this is a fierce male city. Fierce meaning violent? Fierce meaning very. Few people moved on the opposite quay. This Maureen had noticed about her time living here. The quays on both sides of the lee here were quieter than they should have been, not in a peaceful way, but in a way that suggested suspicion. Maureen had lived alone with two empty floors above her. The walls were imbued with bad feeling, down to her actions as much as the men who'd occupied their leisure there. It could have been that she was giving it unnatural shadows, that she was shook now with sentiment, assigning meaning to meagre things. Fierce, very, violently, she added. One time I stopped a lad jumping into the lee from this footbridge, just before Christmas, three and a half years ago now. That's the violence of the male too, isn't it? When they finish wrecking all around them, they turn on themselves. None of the ones spoke. Maureen exhaled and turned to them. Though things grow in the cracks of all sorts of wrecks, she said, and it's far from parched, this city. The lee keeps bursting its banks. I think sometimes it's putting manners on the place. I'm sure you don't want to hear about brothels and suicide attempts. But there's light and dark, and every city has plenty of both. What you see now, she flicked a wrist at the river's course, is the fruits of my labours, or the labours of my generation. One of the ones saw the opening and said, Are there many Europeans here? We're all Europeans, Maureen said sternly. Continentals is what I'd call you. Yes, yes, the place is hopping with you. But I wasn't saying the only people here are the children of the natives. I mean, Ireland is changing a lot. It isn't changing enough, Maureen said. And because the ones looked restless, she said, Germans are pure mad for sausages. The one who looked least perplexed said, Oh, you mean mad about? What we'll do, Maureen said, is go along the south bank here to the Opera House and the Crawford Gallery, up to the Huguenot Cemetery, on to Panna, down Mutton Lane, so you can see the mural, and then in through the English market where you'll find the best sausages in Ireland. And before I leave you, I'll point out the port of Cork, which is on the second largest harbour in the world. We're a pirate city, damn good at coming second. But have you ever heard the saying... She paused. She had a showmanship, Maureen Phelan, and on this occasion she thought it wasn't going to get her into trouble. Ireland, she said would sink without its cork. We'll jump forward a little bit until Maureen has said goodbye to her tourists and she's met a person that she knows in a coffee shop. It must have been that Maureen's countenance was not so interesting as to linger in the memory for the best part of a decade. She stared, but Tony Cusack's mind was elsewhere. He didn't look at her once. She considered a coughing fit. The three Germans had insisted on tipping her 20 euro. She decided to spend some of it on a sticky bun and a pot of tea while she self-evaluated. 
The Germans were happy with their histories and homilies. It was, as she thought, people could be very receptive to the truth if it was sufficiently ugly. It was the humdrum truths they despised. She thought that she would like to show more people around. Not just tourists, but the new Irish. But the old Irish who had lost their knowledge of the city. But miscreants. But those who needed to see the damage they'd done. TDs, robbers, the Chamber of Commerce. She would like a mandate to have a word. Tony Cusack came in when she had almost finished her bun. A prime candidate. A man who needed to be dragged up and down the quays and asked what he was at knocking around with Jimmy when he had six children at home to feed and clothe and put through school, giving the same dangerous ideas to his son. If he had been on his own, she would have plonked herself beside him and taken his confession. But he was with a blonde girl and a dark-haired toddler boy, whose lineage was obvious and whose presence gladdened her greatly. The blonde girl's eyes were large and her demeanour calm, some feline quality though Maureen was not so deluded as to overlook her own narrative sensibilities in coming to this conclusion. She was remembering Ryan, his restlessness, his short fuse, his contrary hunger for praise. And based on Ryan had come up with a woman who'd give birth to his son. Feline meaning graceful, clever, cool until provoked. She would like to introduce herself, shake this girl's hand, look directly at her face. She wanted the measure of her, For, of course, this girl was her own person, not made to smooth out his faults. But she saw her in conjunction. She saw her as the keeper of intimacies, the person most familiar with her old pet soul. Maureen had seen herself in a similar role, one time, with a bearded boy called Dominic Looney. She watched the blonde girl carry the little fella to the counter. She watched Tony's grandson point at the cakes, cuddle his mother, parrot thank yous at the cashier. She wondered what had possessed them, Ryan and this girl, to spark into being another little life, whether it was their intention in their greed for one another. Tony and his grandson's mother had only low words to say to one another. She bought him two coffees. He rubbed his chin or forehead frequently. On occasion his chest bulged. She followed them out of the cafe and kept her distance as they made their way to the bus stop. There they parted ways. Carrying the little boy, the blonde girl walked towards and past Maureen, away from the river. Maureen watched Tony lean against the side of the bus shelter with his arms folded. Now she could make him recognise her. Instead, she turned and followed the girl and the little boy. They went into the centre on the Grand Parade. The girl set the child down and they wandered between the displays, holding hands. Maureen picked up a box of Mr Kipling Viennese Worlds. The girl and her little boy took a bottle of water from the drinks fridge. Then he held his his arms out and she picked him up. Maureen went up beside them. Well, hello, she smiled at the little lad. Hello there, doughty thing. What's your name? He stuck his finger in his mouth and pushed his face into his mother's shoulder. A doughty... Maureen said. He's shy. Will you not tell me your name, Crater? The girl smiled. This is Dermid. Dermid, Maureen said. How old is he? He'll be three in August. He will, Maureen affirmed. He will, that's right. He's very like his father. Excuse me, the girl said. Maureen headed for the till, tugging at Dermid's right foot as she passed. Ryan, she said putting her biscuits on the counter. God, he's very like Rain. The girl followed. How do you know Rain? Her tone was suspicious. Maureen gave the cashier a fiver and turned back. Don't I know his grandmother? She said. This was not a lie. She remembered Noreen Cusack from years back. How do you know me then? The girl asked. Should I not? You were with him long enough. This was the point the girl should have relaxed and smiled and granted that this was true. Instead, she held the child closer and stepped past Maureen to the counter. Well, he's fierce like him, Maureen went on softly. And his granddad too. The girl finished paying. He is, she said. Doesn't bode well. Maureen tittered, but the girl only sighed. And why would you say that? Maureen asked. The girl finished paying and stood back, a cardboard display between her and Maureen. The little fella reached for something Maureen couldn't see. His mother let him. 
People always say he looks like Ryan, she said. No one ever says he looks like me. I mean, he doesn't, but no one lies even out of kindness. I'm the one who had him like. I was 16 hours in labour. He was nearly nine pounds. Well, he has your nose, Maureen said. He does not, said the girl vehemently. Maureen let on as if the idea had only just come to her. I suppose it's a strange compliment. Like the child looking like its father proves its mother's virtue. Excuse me, the girl said again. Or that it's a compliment to the child or to the fella. Cork is like that with fellas, don't you think? Well, I don't know, but I'll tell you what. All day people have been talking about Ryan to me and it's wrecking my head a bit. I'm sorry, Maureen said. But sure I don't know you, so I can't be asking after you. The girl crossly conceded. Fair play to you for spotting the pattern, though, Maureen said. I was only thinking about it earlier, and here I am, I suppose, on the surface, as bad as the rest of them. He's a credit to you, little dear mate. He's a doughty boy. She only think he's doughty because he looks like his father, said the girl. Not at all. Haven't you a lovely rig out on him? That's true. I do change his clothes the odd time. Maureen, who appreciated sarcastic women, smiled broadly. The girl raised her eyes to heaven. When's he home, anyway? Maureen asked. Who, Rain? How do you know he's coming home? Isn't it on the little website they have? There was an odd beat, and the girl said, Is that really how Nana Cusack's friends track Rain? Online. We all have access to the internet, Maureen said. Funny things you'd be looking up, said the girl. Her goodbye was a light, slow head shake. She left the shop, the child pointing merrily at this and that over her shoulder, and Maureen felt tetchy enough to wonder, or to think it was no wonder Cork chose to exalt its men if the young ones were so odd. She changed her mind a moment later. It just wasn't a nice feeling to be triggering disquiet this soon. Thank you for letting me read from the Rules of Revelation. Um, thanks. <laughs>